Praise the Lord. Thank you, Pastor Rick. Thank you. It's been a great joy to be with you these last few days. Um, on Saturday, I started with the leaders, and then we went Sunday morning, Sunday night, Monday, Tuesday, and here we are Wednesday. Tomorrow, 3.30, I'll be on the road. Back to the airport with Doug. Pray for him. <laughs> you don't have to pray for me about that one. Um, I can get up early and be fully alert, but I do pray for my brother who has to make the sacrificial journey. Uh, it's not as far as Jesus had to journey because he came from heaven to earth and from the earth to the cross and from the cross to the grave. You've just got to drive an hour and 15 minutes each way. Um, so, um, yeah, it's been a joy to be with you. I fly home tomorrow. I have a few days break and then... Um, uh, I have a very, very busy rest of the year, but I have so much enjoyed the presence of God here, the atmosphere of faith, and I trust that you have been somewhat touched by the glory of God so far, and we'll end it tonight. Tonight, I, I, I want to almost like bring three messages into one. And um, the way I want to do it is the theme really was about around the fires of revival, which I started on Sunday morning. Then I went Sunday night, the touch of God. Then I felt Monday, Tuesday, faith. Because to operate in the full measure of the Spirit, you have to be full of faith. Uh, full of faith, full of the Spirit. This is the normal Christian life. Um, tonight, I want to deal with the fire of God, I want to deal with the authority of the believer, and I want to deal with the responsibility of the believer. So I'm going to kind of blend three messages in one, um, but I believe they will come together in the Spirit, and you'll see where I'm going. Um, go with me to Luke's Gospel, chapter 12 and verse 49, and it says, I came to send a fire on the earth, says Jesus, and how I wish it were already kindled. So Jesus came for many reasons. I came to seek and to save the lost. He came to take our place as the Lamb of God. I come that you might have life and have it more abundantly. There are various reasons why Jesus came, but here's one where we, we don't often go here. I came to send a fire on earth. When you go to most commentators, they immediately talk about the fire of judgment. Um, and, and it's true that he came to bring judgment. Actually, the judgment was laid upon him. He not even came to bring judgment. He became that sacrifice that would pay the penalty for the sins of the world that he was judged, that we would be justified. That's one of those little emojis, you know, mind-blowing to think that he put such value on our lives that the exchange, the only adequate exchange to satisfy the claims of heaven's justice was for the Lamb of God, the spotless Lamb of God, the Word who became flesh, to go and to die in our place, to take the sins of the world, to take the sicknesses of the world, the poverty of the world, the destruction of the world, the curse of the law upon himself, and to hang poised between hell and heaven on earth, and to, to pay the price in full that this amazing grace would be offered to us that would bring us into sonship, into righteousness, and to become the possessor of all that He has done for us. Hallelujah. There is another aspect when it says, I came to send a fire on earth. I believe this speaks about the fire of the Holy Spirit. Because in John chapter uh, uh, Luke uh, uh, chapter 3 and verse 16, uh, John the Baptist said, I indeed baptize you with water, 
but one mightier than, than I is coming, whose sandal strap I'm not worthy to loose. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and with fire. And we know on the day of Pentecost that there came the sound from heaven like the mighty rushing wind and filled the house and they were all filled and then divided tongues of fire sat on each one of them. None in that room were excluded from this empowerment and this holy passion and fire that would come upon them. Thirdly, there is another dimension to this holy fire which speaks about the zeal, the word zeal. Jesus, the zeal for the Father's house consumed him. That word zeal is actually rooted in fire, which again links to the fire of passion. Just drop the volume fractionally for me, if you don't mind. And, and so we see that not only did he come to empower our lives, to take our place in judgment, but he came to put the fire and the zeal and the passion in us. Even as the prophetic word came, he came to separate for himself a holy people. Holiness is not just our behavior, our conduct, our thoughts, our words, but very much it's connected to separation. We are no longer in the world as the citizens of the world, even though in a few weeks, even starting, I think yesterday, we as citizens of this nation can vote. But our true citizenship is in heaven. And while we're on earth, we are the saints of God, sanctified, set aside by the blood of Jesus and by the oil of the Spirit, to serve God and to represent God. And as the prophetic word came, not only are we a holy people, but we are wholly His. We are all in. That means that we are all out of the world and we're all into the kingdom and the things of God. We are not church attendees. We are the church. We are God's people. We are in Him and He is in us. There is no division. The wall of enmity, of separation has been dealt with. The curtain has been torn and from top to bottom. And the glory of God now resides in us and we reside in Him. As Paul said, speaking of the philosophers, in Him we live and move and have our being. But we could also justifiably say in in us, he lives and moves and has his being. Because we are one with him and he is one with us. And therefore, as Corinthians says, when we speak, we speak on behalf of God, be reconciled to God. We become his voice. We are the oracles of God. We are the hands of God. And Jesus even said, you are the light of the world, giving us the same reputation that was given to him as the light of the world. He says, now you are the light of the world. We are the, the vehicles of God's glory. I like to think of our lives as we are, the, we are the living epistles read by men. We are the closest that they will ever get for many of them to read the Scriptures. <laughs> they will see the unfading glory. Moses had a fading glory and he's, he had to have a mask on his face. We are partakers of that same Shekinah that was upon Jesus on the Mount of Transfiguration when the flesh was unveiled to be revealed to Peter, James, and John, Elijah, and Moses on that holy mountain, and the Father spoke from heaven. That same glory that was given to Jesus, the glory the Father has given to me, I give to you. Adam and Eve only recognized their nakedness because they fell short of the glory of God. And their, their 
their spiritual garments were revealed, uh, were removed, and they stood in nakedness, guilt and shame, fear, hiding from the presence of God, but we are now clothed in the unfading glory of God. We are carriers of His Word, of His power, of His love to our generation. We are not just saved, which is more than enough, but we are empowered and set ablaze by the Spirit of God. The normal Christian life is the Spirit-filled life or the God-possessed life. Jesus commanded them to stay in Jerusalem. Why? Because He wanted that fire, that baptism of the Spirit and fire to be upon each one of them. And today, the, the Christian church very much has become unaware of the realms of the Spirit if anything, the last day's church, the true apostolic church in the spirit of the primitive apostolic church will walk in great fire and power. The very intention at the beginning of time. In 1 Thessalonians 5 and verse 19, Paul writes and he says, do not quench the spirit. In other words, do not suppress or subdue the Holy Spirit operating in and through your life. If anything, you should be, as Paul says in 2 Timothy 1, 6, to stir up the gift of God, to fan into flame the dying embers, not only of your love, but this holy fire of the anointing and of the passion and the zeal of the Lord of hosts that is within you. We are to desire spiritual gifts to be operating in and through our surrendered lives. Because we are not just operating as citizens of planet earth, but we are the ambassadors of God, carrying His word and His power. That's why I said we've got to be full of faith and full of the spirit. You cannot walk in these dimensions void of faith. So while we grow in grace and in the knowledge of the Lord, we've got to grow in sensitivity to the realms of the Spirit, and we've got to grow as well in faith to be built up, edified in our most holy faith, which is really the extension of our relationship and our access to God. Now, if you'll remember on Sunday morning for those who were here, that Paul on the island of Patmos, when the fire went out, he went and gathered sticks because fire must have fuel. We call it the fire triangle, oxygen, heat, and fuel. If you remove the oxygen, the fire will go out. If you remove the heat, the fire will go out. But certainly if you remove the fuel, the fire will go out. In terms of the realms of the Spirit, God gives the fire. The fire fell from heaven, the original fire that was on the altar. And he said, this fire must not go out. In other words, you have to remove the ashes, take them outside of the, the city gates, and have fresh fire or fresh fuel so that the fire that has come from God won't go out. Paul went and gathered sticks because he understood if there's no fuel, the fire will go out. Now, God supplies the heat. He is the fire. God supplies the, the oxygen because he is the breath. <laughs> he is the air that we breathe as we sing. But we supply the wood. There are some things that he does, and there are some things that we do. Many times Christians want God to do what He's told us to do. We desire spiritual gifts. We desire the pure milk of the Word that we may grow thereby. We ask. We call. We engage and serve. There are some things that we, 
we do that God doesn't do, unless we do it, God doesn't do it. Even for the parting of the waters, God could have just gone, and Israel would have walked on dry land, but he said to Moses, put your staff in the water, beat that water, and then it opened and made a way. There are certain things that we do that releases what God wants to do in and through us. It's called faith. It's called obedience. It's called hearing from God and doing what God calls us to do. And, And so remember when I talk about what we do, we're not saved by what we do. We are saved by what He has done. But because we are saved, there are certain things that we do. For example, we gather the wood that keeps the fire burning. If you get out of fellowship with the saints, you'll grow cold. If you neglect the Word, you will become inaccurate and insensitive to the voice of God. If you neglect prayer, even though you have access to the treasury of heaven, you probably won't see the provision coming into your life. If you neglect your sowing, you will not see your reaping. There are certain things that you do that unless you do it, God doesn't do it. How will they hear without a preacher? Unless we preach, they will not hear. Lay hands on the sick and they will recover. Unless you put your hands on the sick, they probably are not going to recover. There are certain things that we do as they went everywhere preaching the Word. God was working with them, confirming the Word with signs following. If they went nowhere, guess what? Nada. Nothing was going to happen. Now, if I were God and I wanted the world saved... I would just say, I'm counting down 10, 9, 8, 7. There's going to be no like long protracted period. You either get right or in the next few seconds, you are no more. And you can see that I'm not God. It's quite obvious by my behavior and my thoughts. Um, But God has chosen these vessels to whom he gave dominion on earth to operate through. People get saved. But no, he chooses the weak, the foolish, the normal to become his voice. (laughs) That's why I say, if we don't do, he said, go into all the world. Guess what? If we don't go, the nations remain unreached. Even though you're not saved by your going, they are. You're not saved by your doing, but it's the evidence of what He has done that manifests through the obedient, surrendered heart. We have been given the authority of God. Uh, I was, I was reading a quote by John G. Lake, one that I brought with me 30 years ago from South Africa, carried it in my suitcase, about 20 pounds of copies of copies of copies of John G. Lake sermons. I was allowed two suitcases, and one of them was filled with John G. Lake sermons. I gave away libraries of Spurgeon's entire collection, my Greek studies, my Hebrew studies, and every desired book of most theologians, rows and rows of books I gave to friends and colleagues, but I kept my notes. And I was reading this, and I'm I'm sure it's going to grip your heart with revelation. You need to just open your ears and catch it. It's so profound. Man in God and God in man. One mind, one purpose, 
one power and one glory. The unifying of the nature of man and God is the crowning achievement of Jesus Christ. Wow. So powerful. The purpose was not just to save us from our sins, but to empower a people that would represent Him on earth. Now, He has given us such great authority and position. I want to talk about that for a few minutes as I start to bring this in. In um, 1 John chapter 4 and verse 17, it's well known, we hear it often, but I remind you of it. Love has been perfected among us in this, that we may have boldness in the day of judgment, because as He is, so are we in this world. As He is righteous, so we have been made righteous. In other words, we share in this divine glory. As He is, we have become partakers of His divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. So this is not just a scripture speaking of a future judgment in the sweet by and by, but this is a position in reality that we enjoy in the Spirit, that as He is, so are we in this world. <laughs> wow. Now that, again, is one of those scriptures that can you ever get tired of hearing of this esteemed position that we share in sonship, that we would be made these partakers of this divine glory and this position in authority. But listen to it in the Passion Translation. It's just so powerful. By living in God, love has been brought to its full expression in us so that we may fearlessly face the day of judgment because, because all that Jesus now is, so are we in this world. <laughs> wow. As Jesus now is, so are we in this world. James put it this way in James chapter 1 and verse 18. Of His own will, He brought us forth by the word of truth that we might be the kind of first fruits of His creatures. In other words, Jesus our Savior, Lord, Master, Healer, Deliverer is our elder brother. And we have been made partakers and co-heirs together with Him. And that in this position in Christ, whose we are, what we are, and what we've been given <laughs> is equal to what Jesus has. You haven't been dealt like a lesser blow. You're a co-heir, this first fruits. In Adam, we were like Adam. But we are no longer in Adam. We are now in Christ. This new creation of superior innovation. Why? Because in Adam, there is sin, there is failure. But in Christ, there is none. Because he has conquered hell and death and has the keys. We are in him and he is in us. <laughs> now you and I can fail and fall, but his redemption will never fail and fall. <laughs> he will never violate his own word over our lives. That doesn't give us the, the, the right to live like we want to. It gives us the right to live as a holy people. But now, instead of trying to do it out of our discipline, our morality, out of our character, we do it from a persuaded new creation heart. <laughs> there is no longer effort in this because it's who we are. 
I think we sing it. It's who we are. This is who I am. It's not who I will be in the sweet by and by, but as He is in this world, that's who I am. <laughs> this will freak you out. But in righteousness, because it is an imputed and an imparted righteousness, in righteousness you have equal access to the Father as Jesus Himself has enjoyed when He walked on earth. You will never have to approach the throne of God as a groveling servant, neither as an arrogant, spoiled brat, but with humility and with a heart of worship, with deep appreciation and a, and a sense of the fear of God, we can approach with boldness because His blood is speaking louder than the flesh, than our frailty, than our weakness and declares us the righteousness of God, not the righteousness of Leon or the righteousness of Doug, but the righteousness of God. Your righteousness in Him is not inferior to His. <laughs> That's why... In uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 17, it says, If anyone be in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away. What's the old? The old way of living. The things that gripped our lives have passed away. They have lost their grip. It's like the devil has lost the ability to hold on to our lives. His vice-like grip. How many of you have ever used those vices um, where you turn the little thing on the end? Vice grips. I have no idea. It takes me to phone someone and say, hey, can you come and fix this in my house? And you'll say, well, why don't you just learn? Because divorces are really expensive these days. And it's just so much easier to get a professional in. But I do know there's that little vice grippy thing that once that thing grips, you can, unless you unscrew it, go the right way, Leon, always go the opposite way, then it will loosen its grip. The blood of Jesus has broken the grip of sin hell, death, demons off your life. And you're now in the hands of the Lord. It's a loving touch. No man will pluck you out of his hand. You were in the grip of hell itself, but that has been broken by his death, resurrection, ascension, and glorification. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Behold, all things are brand new. Notice where the beholders. Behold, all things are brand new. Many people live in guilt and shame even though they have been made righteous and therefore they can, cannot come to optimum position and maturity because they are beholding the past and not the present. When you're anchored in your pain, disappointment, sin, guilt, and shame, it's very hard to become what you are <laughs> because your mind, your emotions, your feelings, your inadequacies are screaming louder, louder than the identity that is in you. That's why we have to amplify the sound of revelation. I love Galatians chapter 6 and verse 15. It says, For in Christ Jesus, neither circumcision nor uncircumcision avails anything but a new creation. The new creation being the new creation species. And in Colossians chapter 3 and verses 10 and 11, And have put on the new man, 
who is renewed in the knowledge according to the image of him, according to the image of him, according to the image of him. When you put on the new man, it is in the image of him who created him where there is neither Greek nor Jew, circumcised nor uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave, nor free, but Christ is all and in all. Wow. In him, in his image. That's why I believe the greatest of all miracles is the miracle of the new birth, of the new creation. Because you can be physically healed, you'll still die. You can be prospered, but you'll still die. And you can take nothing with you. You understand, you can have a miracle breakthrough in your body, in your relationships, in your finances. But those miracles, even though they are God-given, they pale in superiority to this new identity that is in Christ Jesus. Why do I speak like this when I'm talking about the fire, authority, and responsibility? Because we are not living from the outside in, but we are living from the inside out. Out of the heart come all the issues of life through the power that works mightily in us and through us that this is the new creation walk that we have. Many of you will know that I am the chairman of Overland Missions. We've been in existence for 25 years now. And some of the young ladies from Overland Missions have visited you and shared. Um, these <laughs> missionaries, and, and I started Overland. It started in me because that's what I wanted to do is mobilize people. But as my ministry in the U.S. went more into revival and then into education, training, and equipping. I knew that that was such a vital calling that I gave it to Phil Smith, who's the founder and the president. And he said, Leon, I'll only do it on one condition, that you sign the 501c3 papers, you pay for the registration that no one can say I took it from you. Because it is what I always wanted to do. And people said to me when I came to the U.S., what are you doing here? I said, I'm raising up missionaries for the nations, especially for the continent of Africa. That's all I ever wanted to do. But I realized that that was such a huge thing, and I couldn't quench what God was doing now on this side. So I said, Phil, you run with that. And he ran, and it's exploded we now have 800 full-time missionaries who are not living in poverty in the mission field. They are highly prospered, successful, working the works of God. Signs, wonders, and miracles that you read about in the primitive churches happening in these nations. Wide doors, just amazing, amazing, amazing things. But I, I did the math. The reason these young people are doing so well is that in our training, we solidify them in their identity and their authority and their responsibility in Christ. Because you can never operate in the dimensions of faith, the faith of God, with a spirit of inferiority inside of you. <laughs> you will always feel inadequate to move that mountain, to release that word, to do that thing that God has placed upon you. The only way you can do it is in the confidence of the identity that you have discovered in Christ Jesus. The only way you can cast out demons and heal the sick and work the works of God is to be secure in the revelation of your identity. And when the people come into to Overland, they are drilled in the revelation of identity. <laughs> so that when they get out there, they're carriers of what God said they can do and be, and they are. And nations are opening, kings, sultans, nations, lands, prosperity, success. Those guys just walk in it. 
some of them 19, 20, 21, doing works that we've read about in the ancient books. Just young men, but they're secure in their position and their identity. Or like Abraham, they have the persuaded heart. They have the persuaded, they have been con convinced that they, they are what God says they are. Therefore, they can do what God says they can do. They're not trying to do it. They are living it from the inside out. Religion lives it from the outside in. And then always seems to be frustrated by our inability and the issues. But the issues are coming from within and manifesting on earth. With that in mind, a couple of quick scriptures in James chapter 1. And, I, and Pastor Rick, don't judge me. I'm taking it slightly out of context. I'm putting a little preamble here because I'm just going to just shift it a little bit. Not in error, but just to show you a principle and analogy. James 1, 23 to 25. For if anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is like a man observing his natural face in a mirror. For he observes himself, goes away, and immediately forgets what kind of man he was. Was, But he who looks into the perfect law of liberty, law of liberty, and continues in it and is not a forgetful hearer but a doer of the work, this one will be blessed in what he does. For me, the Bible is a mirror. So when I go to the Word and I read it, and I take you to 2 Corinthians 3, 17 and 18. Now the Lord is the Spirit, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. But we all with unveiled face, beholding as in a mirror the glory of the Lord, the analogy of Moses a fading, and now we possessors of an unfading, looking into the glory of the Lord, are being transformed into the same image from glory to glory, just as by the Spirit of the Lord. So every time you get into the Word, this mirror reflects who you are. Because your face is identified in the face of Christ, in the image of who He is. You're no longer viewing yourself according to the flesh, but you're viewing yourself according to the Spirit. Like I used the analogy of the poor man in torn shorts, torn shirt, little bare feet walking into the place, and I view him as a man that is in poverty, yet he's raised six men from the dead in the mosques. He's a mighty man of God on the inside, but I viewed him according to the flesh on the outside and viewed him as a beggar. And the problem is, the one problem is we view others according to the flesh, but the second problem is when we view ourselves according to the flesh, that we see ourselves in our frailia, our frailty, our weakness, our flaws, and not hidden in the face of Christ. So that's how you will conduct your life because as a man thinks in his heart, so is he. So you have to have the transformed mind that gets into agreement with what the Word says you are. That you can do what the Word says you can do. <laughs> and you can't have the doubt, the unbelief. You have to have the revelation the persuaded heart, that that's what I am. You cannot stand for healing when you doubt that it's yours. You cannot stand for answered prayer if you don't believe the, the access that you have is the equal access that Jesus has in righteousness. So therefore you come with like a casino mentality, I wonder if this is my lucky day. Instead of from the persuaded heart, when you pray, you believe, you receive, and you shall have it. Amen. <laughs> Amen. I believe it. I believe it. I have faith. 
Yeah, there you go. I want to read 2 Corinthians 3, 17 and 18 in the Amplified Bible. Just brings a dimension of understanding. Now the Lord is the Spirit, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty, emancipation from bondage, true freedom. And we all, with unveiled face, continually seen as in a mirror the glory of the Lord, are progressively being transformed into His image from one degree of glory to another degree of glory, which comes from the Lord, who is the Spirit. In other words, we are, but we're becoming more and more what we are. That's why we stay in the Word. That's why we stay in the atmosphere of worship, because there is a transfiguration that is taking place on the holy mount of faith. Well. So, let's quickly glance at the authority that we have as sons and daughters of the Most High God. Jesus said, all authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go therefore. And you remember when Peter and John came to the gate called Beautiful, they said, such as I have... I give unto you. What did they have? They had the authority, the revelation of the authority that was found in that name. So that when they spoke the name of Jesus, it wasn't a formula, it wasn't a cliche, but it was a revelation of identity. It was a revelation of authority. So, it's like if you go to the ATM machine and you've got the card, but you don't have the PIN number, you can put the card in, but you'll never get anything coming out. You've got to have the code. You can have the card and you can have access to the ATM, but you need the PIN number. If you want God's PIN number, I'll give it to you. It's Pearly Gate 777. <laughs> but because there's been so much corruption, so when you do it, you've got to put, you know, it's 37777 exclamation mark. That's your four pin exclamation mark. That gets the access. Is login. Pearly Gate 777, but the PIN for your debit, your withdrawal card is 777, exclamation mark. Go try it. <laughs> when Jesus said, all authority is given to me, he was empowering and commissioning those then but every subsequent saint thereafter to walk in that shared or delegated authority. It's a stewardship that is given to you. It's a stewardship of sonship, just as Jesus was faithful in God's house. And he made himself of no reputation, taking on the form of a bondservant, being obedient. These are keys. Therefore, God has highly exalted him and given him a name which is above every name. And so when you operate in that authority, you have to have that same attitude that was in Jesus for that authority to flow through you, which is humility, obedience, faithfulness, and diligence. <laughs> because if you try just the formula, it doesn't work. It's not just saying it from the lips, but it's from the persuaded heart, understanding the authority and standing in security and sonship with the attitude that was found in Christ Jesus. Amen. Lest you step into some kind of a hyper-spiritual arrogance. In that authority, 
you have been given authority over sickness, demons, hell. You understand? You stand in superiority because you have been seated in heavenly places far above these authorities. So when you speak the name of Jesus, it's not from the gravitational force of the earth, but as those seated in heavenly places in Him. So when you use the name, you're using it from a heavenly persuasion, not from the gravitational force of humanity. It's a delegated authority. It's not yours, it's His. And He entrusts it to you that you would use that authority with the right heartbeat that is in unison with His. It is not some ego trip, but it is operating in the true spirit of Christ. He gives you authority to tread on serpents, scorpions, over all the power of the devil. He gives you the authority to pray in His name. He gives you the authority to access the full provision that is found in sonship. So He gives you authority. And you should stand in that authority with confidence. But there is a dimension that I need to go into. And I want to talk briefly about our responsibilities. In um, one of my sayings, I have many, but one of my sayings is, the measure of your authority will never exceed the measure of your humility. Because if you don't have the humility of the heart of Christ, you'll operate in arrogance. So flowing in that authority is from the heart of humility. I have another saying. Good one. Pastor Rick gets his pen and notebook. But with authority, which is delegated, comes responsibility. And with responsibility comes accountability. It's not a free for all. It's God's work done God's way. It's not done our way. It's His way. His will that must be done. So to understand the the boundary lines have fallen for us in pleasant places, but there are boundary lines that we stay within the realm of the Spirit. We stay within the realm of the Word. We stay in the realm of love. We're not exceeding those boundary lines. We're not operating in selfishness. We're operating in selflessness. But understanding that with this holy investment and entrustment, there is an expectation that we do with what He has given us what needs to be done. Being given this authority, power, and ability is not a reason to live in a lackadaisical, soft-bellied, gutless, weak-kneed kind of a way. It should inspire us to passion should inspire us to take on something bigger than ourselves. So, um, because we will give an account, not for judgment, but for reward. Now, if you do nothing with what you have been given, you will never reach your destiny and potential. You'll be saved singing your favorite hymn, Amazing Grace, How Sweet the Sound. But that's it. You'll be saved by the blood of Jesus. But you'll never know the joy of casting crowns at His feet that have come to you because of what He has done. Therefore, it goes back to Him. With sonship comes responsibility or stewardship. And I want to discuss that just in closing. Um, there is um, a saying I have, another saying, which is not mine. I've coined it from a friend of mine, Duncan Filmer, who's also from Zimbabwe or Rhodesia. But it's not so much responsibility, but listen to this. It's responding to his ability. <laughs> so 
In other words, it's in Him, by Him, through Him, and for Him. Apart from Him, we can do nothing. In Him, we live and move and have our being. So it's God who's at work in us both to will and to do. All we are really doing is conforming to the will of God that is already existing in you. Therefore, we are not thinking more highly of ourselves than we ought to. We are not exceeding the authority and the position and the giftedness that is in our lives. We see ourselves soberly as He has given to us the measure of faith and the giftings that He has granted to us. And we operate in that dimension. We don't try to be something that we are not. Does that make sense? Neither does that attitude demand that you make yourself less than what you are. It's one thing to get into arrogance and to make yourself more than what you are, but it's just as bad to make yourself some pseudo-humble being that quenches what God has gifted you to be. So it's this balance, it's this tension between uh, uh, the gifting, the calling, the faith, and the, the, the aligning our lives to that, not exceeding it, not making it less, but finding ourselves secure in that gifting, calling, and position that He's given to us. But remember, some of the... Um, Parts of the human body are not exalted, and yet they're very important. Sometimes what seems unimportant holds special place in the health and the well-being of the church, and the failure of those unseen, what we sometimes view as unimportant gifts, can really damage the health and the well-being of the of the church so that's why everyone needs to discover their place and function in that with joy with passion abandonment surrender and faith now i want to close with these thoughts try and summarize it remember much is given much is required freely you have received freely give you can't give away what you don't have you can't give away what you are not. That makes you a spiritual fraud. You can only give from the entrustment that God has placed within you. So here are, to summarize in a few things, what I believe are our responding to His ability. Number one, live a life worthy of His calling. Ephesians chapter 4, verses 1 and 3. We are called to live in a manner worthy of the calling that we have received, exhibiting humility, gentleness, patience, and love in all of our relationships. Number two, we must abide in Christ. We must stay in that place of relational security, even though... <laughs> You constantly are in fellowship and access with God. We pray without ceasing. In other words, you always have access. You're one with Him. But set time aside in the Word, in prayer, in praying in the Spirit to stay in that place of abiding. Lest you find yourself overcome by the pressures of life and the desires for stuff that eventually you begin to neglect your relational being with God. I don't like putting a, a guilt trip on people because sometimes you wake up in the morning and, and you're busy and you're running all day and then people get this mentality like, uh, I didn't get in the Word, I didn't get in prayer, this is going to be a bad day. I don't think like that. Life happens, stuff goes wrong. When that happens, don't get into a guilt trip and say, well, the day is ruined, the enemy has got the upper hand. Remember, while you're driving, you can be praying. While you're walking, you can be meditating in the Word. 
the word dwells in you. So you, you're not like neglecting your walk with God. You're always in Him, and He is always in you. But like Jesus, we have seasons where we go into the wilderness, so separate ourselves, and we read, we study, we pray, and we call upon the Father. Amen. Amen. I think it's great if you can establish a routine in your life. For some people, it's the early morning. Some people, it's in the evenings. We are all different. I like the early mornings. Um, early will I seek Him. <laughs> but early doesn't mean early in the morning. It means my highest priority will be to seek Him. Some people are not morning people. You know, they're not good in concentration in the morning. They just like have to get up and slowly osmos into the world. You want to you wanna be, be at your prime in thinking, in, con, in, in contemplation and meditation when you separate yourself to the Word and to prayer. So um, you can maybe, if you're very busy, just have three times a day. Start early in the morning, at lunchtime, evening, before you go to bed. Take a portion of the Old Testament, take a portion of the New Testament, take some Psalms and pray. And then when you pray, don't just get into a, a, a ritual like the Gentiles where you just pray with vain repetitions, begging and pleading, trying to get the attention of God. Just pray in the Spirit. And then pray the solution and speak the Word of God into that situation. Prophesy the Word into that situation. Make your declarations of God's Word. Um, I, don't, I, don't, I would rather pray for 15 minutes and be effective because I pray the Word and I pray in faith than pray for an hour but be ineffective because I just mumble, mumble, mumble and go through the motions and then feeling like, I've got another five minutes. What am I going to say next? Do you know what I'm saying? This isn't like some legalistic system. It's a relationship. But I've discovered this. I've got to a place now where I want to spend six to ten hours a day in the Word, which is a full working day. You understand? And those six to ten hours are like when I'm done with my meditation and study time, I feel cheated out that I actually have to go and do the things that have to be done. And now as I read the Word, it is so rich. I'm like, "Ah, I just want to write books with every verse I read. Because there's just so much divine truth embodied in every word, every paragraph, every definition. So where you start can grow and go deeper and deeper as your appetite for His presence becomes awakened. But don't go into that like, okay, let's get this done. Go in with a worshiping heart, not like clocking in and clocking out. Do you remember the old days where you'd clock in and clock out? You're not clocking in and clocking out. You live in Him, and He lives in you, and your devotional life is one of desire, and then comes discipline. If you just do it with discipline without the desire, it's going to be a guilt trip. From instead of from glory to glory, from failure to failure. Now listen, I train uh, hundreds of leaders and missionaries and believers. And the number one area, even today I got an email from one of my students saying, the one area, because I asked them, what are your goals in SLT? And, and she wrote, she said, my one weakness is my prayer life. But I, I tell you, just about everyone that goes through my program will say that is their biggest weakness. Not lust, not greed, not their weight, their health exercises. It's prayerlessness. 
Isn't that quite a challenge, eh? And you've got to remember that this abiding is desire, delight, and then will come the third D, the discipline of it. If there isn't the delight and the desire, the discipline won't sustain you. Even me, I'm like OCD, people say. I'm not actually OCD. I'm CDO, because that's in alphabetical order. And it's not a disorder, it's, it's a way of life. And I love it, and I don't want to change it. <laughs> but, but here's the thing with that, you know, people say, oh, Leon, you're so highly disciplined. I am. But the truth is, discipline cannot sustain my prayer life and my study in the Word. It is desire and delight that sustains me, not my discipline. Like I say, I'm an old drill sergeant. I live in the realm of discipline. I know how to enforce it, and I know how to be it. And, um, and, and the truth is that even as a highly disciplined ex-soldier, I cannot do it out of discipline. I do it out of desire and out of delight. I hope you get something out of that. Okay, let me quickly finish. Number one, live a life worthy. Number two, abide. Number three, love God and others. There's no priority. This is just as I came up with this. The greatest commandment is to love God, <clears throat> and the new commandment is to love one another. And this is what we are known by. Our greatest testimony is not our miracles, our healings, our breakthroughs. Our greatest testimony is our love. Let us be known as a people who love God and love one another. Number four, let's spread the gospel. That is our responsibility. How will they hear without a preacher? The Great Commission is go. What part of go don't you get? Is it the G or the O? What is that, number four? Yeah. Number five. One, two, three, four, five. Serve others. I call this the ministry of the bowl and towel. It's the same attitude of Jesus. I'm not against foot washing in the church. There are different ordinances, baptism, communion. Some people see the ordinance of washing feet and then the laying of hands or ordination. But the Washing of feet I don't like as an ordinance in the church because we mostly come to church with clean feet, <laughs> hoping that we put on matching socks <laughs> and that our toenails are clipped. It'd be nothing worse than when the pastor says, hey, I want you all just to take off your socks and shoes and I want to wash your feet today. And you go, ah, I was in the garden and I haven't cut my toenails. <laughs> And invariably for me, it would be the day I put on in a rush my different socks. But, and I see it, but I'm running late, so I go and then, ah, why today? Why today? But I much prefer washing feet to um, doing something for someone because it's needed to be done. For me, it's like if I can find a widow whose house needs painting and go paint that house and washing her feet, you know. Or maybe she can't afford the hairdresser and I'll take her to the hairdresser and say, hey, I'd like to pay for your hair to be cut. And that. You know, to me that's modern day washing of feet because we have clean feet. The washing of feet was dirty feet, dirty roads, came into the building, they left their shoes, their sandals at the door and they washed their feet and we come in pretty much clean. We've got carpeted floors, air conditioning buildings. Our issue is not dirty feet, but people have needs that you can make a difference. And I, I just prefer to do that. And then your stewardship of your resources. And we have a number of resources. It's time. It's talents. It's money. 
It's your health. Be a, a good steward of what God has given you. Uh, don't neglect any of that. Another stewardship that we have is the earth, the land. That's why I believe we have a responsibility for wildlife, for the birds, for the bees, for the animals, the strays. We've got to take responsibility for the well-being of the earth. Um, and, and, you know, if you go into areas of poverty, they, they dirty, they neglect the earth. Their gardens are dirty, unkept. Uh, part of righteousness is doing the right thing in the right way, having a clean, ordered yard, you know, no trash lying around. You don't throw trash out of the window. When you stop, you put it in the right receptacle because we carry ourselves with dignity, respecting the earth. Our first commission was tend to the earth. Also, I'm not against culling of animals. Um, I don't personally kill anymore. Um, I take photos of wildlife, but I was with Bobby and he was sharing that he's got his tree stand. I don't have a problem with killing animals because if you don't cull animals, they will overpopulate and that can cause more damage to that land through overgrazing and especially the the, uh, the forestry is broken down through overgrazing because animals have moved into these contained areas. So we have to cull. I don't like it, but we have to because we're protecting the land. And also just the genetics, the gene pool of animals, you have to shift it around, otherwise it becomes... Um, through inbreeding, it becomes weakened in their state. I speak like I know what I'm doing. <laughs> Trust me, I make this stuff up. <laughs> Pursue holiness. Just because you made righteous doesn't give you the right to do the wrong thing. Righteousness gives you the right to do the right thing at the right way at the right time. Something that I've added here is engage with the community. Get involved in the schools. Get involved in politics. Get involved in the community when there are community events Make friends, not that friendship with the world kind of thing. I'm talking about make friends because you will get opportunity to be light in those places. If we so isolate ourselves from community activities and events, the devil will take those places. Be a voice in those areas as much as possible. Entertainment, the arts, education, science, technology, Believers have to be a voice in those realms. I know you teach on the, the mountains, the seven mountains, um, and, and we want to be a witness in all of those places and be a voice of the prophetic intentions of God into the different realms. So be engaged in the community. Um, another thing is to bear one another's burdens. Help people that can't help themselves. Even though each one has to carry their own load, you can help in that process and see yourself as the good Samaritan. Amen. You know, you see someone in the ditch, get them out, help them out, do something for them. Just bear one another's burdens. Another thing that we're entrusted with is to disciple others. Don't just reach them with the gospel, but disciple them. And uh, that is to... Teach them the foundations, assurance of salvation, the importance of Bible reading, uh, why we attend church, bringing your tithes and offerings, being a witness, prayer, the word, water baptism, baptism in the spirit. Get them in those basics. You can do that in your home. You can break bread with someone once a week that you have influence of, and in so doing, you're bringing them into the kingdom. Some people won't come into the church, so go be the church in their home till they are made whole to come into church. If we just see that their 
fear of coming into the church is rejection, then we will get them to pray the sinner's prayer or make the confession of faith, but they will never grow up. But if we make disciples of those that we can influence, you know, just say to someone, hey, I'd love to come spend 30 minutes a week with you, pray with you and share some Bible truths that will help you in your life. And if you can't go into their home, say, let's do a Zoom, let's do a FaceTime, let's do a, a, a Google um, Meet. And you can actually meet today. I was speaking to a guy in Tanzania who's launching a university at 3 o'clock this afternoon. When you called, that's when, when I was on the phone with him, uh, doing a face-to-face -face with him, helping him to set up a, a university. And it was like we were in the same room. You know, through technology, we are brought so close. So, um, again, um, be involved in discipling others. Help them to grow in Christ. Then protect the unity of the church. That's another responsibility that we have. Make every effort to maintain the unity of the body. Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 3. Make every effort. Another one is stay filled with the Spirit. That's to pray in tongues to press into the glory in worship, just staying in that place. Another one is to be faithful in your tithes and offerings. This is not legalistic giving, but it's, uh, it's you know, religion says you have to. The new creation says I want to. It's a huge difference. You have a new creation mentality when it comes to financial stewardship. And then lastly, be ready for Christ's return. Surrounding all of those things is another responsibility, and that is not to forsake the assembling together. Stay in church, and I'm speaking to the choir tonight, you hear, but this is the right thing to do as much as possible. Attend everything that you can that is beneficial for that aspect of the church. Now, if it's a woman's ministry and you're a man, you're not obligated to attend. Likewise, the women don't have to attend the men's breakfast. You, you understand? As much as you fit into that thing, you don't have to go to the kids' ministry events. <laughs> but you can be praying for the kids' ministry events. You, you can be encouraging the teachers as they prepare for those events. You understand? You can still be involved without being in them. And then through technology, if you can't get into the meeting, then at least listen in. And stay connected to where the church is going in the Spirit and in the Word. So those were some thoughts that I have for you concerning the authority and the responsibility. And then I want to close with this. Nehemiah wanted to be remembered for one thing that was very important to him. And that is that he restored the wood offering. For me, the wood offering is modern day that keeps the fire in you and in the church attending church giving praying involvement washing all those responsibility each time you do one of those things see yourself bringing wood to the altar of the heart and of the church to keep the fire burning everything that you do is another log that keeps the fire burning so it's not just for you personally, but every one of those responsibilities is for you and for us collectively. Yes. Nehemiah restored the wood offering. We need the wood offering to be restored in the church where everyone comes bringing some wood of their prayer, of the word, of their attendance, of their tithes, of their offerings, of their evangelism, of their discipleship, of their serving, of the uh, uh, involvement in the community. Each thing that you do in responsibility is adding to the fire that keeps it burning. When you neglect the fire, it will go out. Stand.